Grace Baptist Church and uh, anybody else that might be listening and watching. Um, we're crazy times. We're living in without a doubt. Um, and obviously this is different this morning. We are, um, I'm at my sister's house. Uh, many of you uh, know that um, my mother passed away last week. And uh, thank you for those of you that have been praying for us and for our family. Um, thank you for that. And uh, But I, I just have... The word of God has been just heavy in my heart in these last several days, this last week or so, and, and uh, I, I hope I hope with the audio wise you're going to be able to hear me and to be able to um, to understand. Hopefully, this is kind of a test thing, right? I just have the phone set up here and I'm sitting here in the sun. And, uh, I've got my my Bible. My I, I turn my Bible on. <laughs> got my coffee. So this is really quite a different type of service this morning. Uh, later we'll be going with my sister to their church, but um, but I just wanted to take a few minutes to share some things that God has put in my heart. Um, as we think about we think about life and we think about death, and um, so if it's okay with you this morning, then I'd like to share a few words with you from uh, John chapter 11. And, uh, but before we do, would you bow with me your heart in, in prayer for just a moment? Lord of all glory, we come before you and thank you and praise you for your word and for your truth. And Lord, this morning I want to just pray that uh, Lord, you would speak to me and speak to us and speak through me to us, Lord. Your word, Lord, is, is not even about me, Father. It's about your word. And it's about how you thought of things. It's about how you um, viewed life. And Lord, and you, you've given us insight into, into, your, into your way of thinking and uh, into how we should view things. And so that's what we're looking at this morning. Um, and so, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, bless this time, strengthen us, help us, Lord, comfort us. Uh, in, in your word, in Jesus' name, amen. So I wanted to, um, you know, as, as we've been thinking about life and we think about death, it's, it's, it's a reality. We cannot escape death. And, and the thought that has been going through my mind and through my heart this last week, and especially that I love my, and I miss my dear mom, and, and the reality of the brevity of life just comes to my comes to my heart and um, I remember I remember when dad was driving down the road and um, and uh, I saw a turtle that had been hit by a car and um, and I, I, I remember it being like upside down and you know how the turtles are and the organs are are all there and um, <clears throat> on the bottom side and so when the turtle's flipped upside down the organs are pressing on the lungs which are on the top which just that by itself would be uh, agonizing and painful for a turtle and, and life threatening and um, and I, I remember I so I pulled over on the side of the road and I, I grabbed the turtle and I just I felt this real pain for this turtle and um, it was a real pain, and uh, you know, wanted to try to do everything I could to help it. But the thought occurred to me later on that day, and, and it was good that I did stop and help the turtle. Um, but to, when we think about matters of life and death, when we, and how we think about things is is important. Um, and the thought occurred to me was was what about what about people? Do we, do we have this compassion for people? But even more specifically, what about knowing the truth and, and people understanding the truth as far as in, in, in relates to eternity? And, uh, and, I, and there was a couple things that I was thinking about as um, I was contemplating the words of Jesus. You know, um, Jesus said some pretty some pretty heavy-duty things, um, and um, that's what we're going to look at today. So we're going to just 
take kind of a quick look, and there's so much in this passage. There is so much more than what we can cover today. But what I want to be able to do is to help us to, to think through and understand things from more of a historical perspective. How was Jesus thinking about these things? And so, this is the story. It's in if you have your Bible and you want to turn into it, turn to it in uh, John chapter 11. And uh, basically, is um, uh, Jesus is uh, with his disciples, and uh, they are they had gotten word that a friend of his was sick. And Jesus was uh, didn't he didn't go right away. He could have he could have went right away and, and he could have healed Lazarus, but he didn't. He waited intentionally, um, and uh, he was pretty direct with his disciples. He, I, I would encourage you to go back and read the whole passage because that's important. But but to understand that here was this family, you know, Mary and Martha, you had. Uh, Lazarus, so they were a very close family, and apparently they had a very close and intimate relationship with Jesus, and um, they loved him so much, and so when Lazarus got sick, it was apparent for them that they should send for Jesus, and they thought, well, naturally, I mean, Jesus is going around healing people, so he would come and he would heal Lazarus, and, um, and uh, the disciples uh, were thinking, Jesus said to them, uh, if you jump uh, up to verse 11, he says, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I will now go and wake him up. And this was a, a curious phrase for the disciples. And the disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will soon get better. They thought that Jesus meant he was simply sleep, sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. And so Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad that I wasn't there. For now you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. So there, Jesus is preparing his disciples for them to see an aspect about life and death that we would not be able to see. When we think about death, if we, when, we're, when we think about something in particular, what do we do? We want to research it. We want to go to, to, to people who have been uh, studying that particular subject uh, and and or if you if you are preparing to go to travel somewhere what do you do you go and you study that area and you talk to people who've been to that area right when we were preparing to go overseas to to live ourselves that we talked to people about that area read books on that area because we wanted to learn as much as we could about that and when we talk about when we talk about life and death you know this is we want to know what's on the other side. And there's very few people that we can talk to about that, right? But we can talk, but, but now here comes along Jesus, and he's demonstrating the power over life. He's demonstrating the powers and, and miracles and things like that that should prompt us to want to ask those questions about life and death. And, and, uh, and that's part of what Jesus was doing with his disciples. And, uh, and so, uh, so that's where we find, excuse me, I got distracted there, uh, but, uh, in any case, so, uh, he's preparing now to take his disciples to, to go, to go see this, and then, of course, in verse 16, it says, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, uh, said to his fellow disciples, let's go to and die with Jesus, because they knew the reality of, that they knew that the, the religious people were very angry with Jesus, and if they went back, it most likely would, would certainly mean that they would die. Um, and then, of course, um, it says that when Jesus arrived in Bethany, he was told that Lazarus was already in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and not many people who had, uh, or and, excuse me, and many people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And so they, there was that understanding that Jesus, uh, that they, they understood that Jesus did have the power. He could have done something. But, but here Martha is demonstrating her 
her faith and saying, Jesus, I know you can do whatever. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. Could you imagine that? Being in that situation, most of us probably, if you're listening to this, you know people that have died. But imagine someone that's saying, that has these miraculous powers, that has the ability to heal people and do these things, saying your brother's going to rise again. Martha's response was, yes, he will rise um, when everyone else does. On the last day, Martha understood that Jesus was going to, that there is a coming time of judgment and resurrection and, and, and coming of God's kingdom. And, and uh, But what Jesus was trying to help her to see was that it was about, it was about understanding and knowing him, that he directly is life. And look what, here's what he says to her in verse 25. He told her, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And anyone who believes in me, even after dying, everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. That's a pretty radical statement. And not anybody can make that kind of statement and back it up. So Jesus is saying, man, if you believe in me, you're never going to die, right? And so, um, and he asked Martha, he asked this question, do you believe that? Do you believe that, Martha? She said, oh, yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah. Now, for those of us that are not Jews, right, we would not, maybe out of context, wouldn't understand what the Messiah is. The Messiah is the what the Jews, who they understood, uh, they, they understood all the way from back from the beginning of time. That man had screwed up, and that man was doomed to die, and that God was going to send someone to fix the problem that we messed up, and that that was the Messiah. And uh, so, understanding that the Messiah was the one that God sent, the Son of God, and, and they're saying, "Yes, we know Jesus. You are the Messiah, the Son of God, who's come to the you know, to this world." Um, then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her. The teacher is here and wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to join her. And Jesus stayed outside the village at the place where Martha met him. When the people were at the house consoling Mary, who were at the house consoling Mary, saw her leave so hastily, they assumed that she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. And when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not And what's interesting to think about this, right? So we are human beings, and we have compassion, and we love our families, and we love them. And, and when they die, it hurts, it's painful. And... Uh, and what's interesting is that the way that Jesus responds in this situation is not the way that we would normally think a response would be. And look at verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her. Now, you got to remember, understand this about Jewish cults. In that time, there were people who were, were called professional mourners. And they would come out during a scene like this and they would make loud weeping noises and they would mourn. And it was it was a part of a way to in Jewish or to create this the, the, the atmosphere, the climate of grieving. And so um, there were people who were that's what they did. They were professional uh, at this. And um, so in a way you could say that some of them were creating, but they weren't necessarily you know, maybe like hypocritical kind of like Morning, not really grieving from your heart, um, but but then they're also mixed with people who knew the family and, and knew the loss and, and all of this, and so all this is there's all this grieving that's going on here, and there's the pain and the suffering, and and it says, and this is what's curious, and this is what's hard to understand. So Jesus saw Mary weeping, and he saw everybody else weeping, and he says a deep anger well within him and he was deeply troubled. Why is Jesus angry? Is he angry at Mary for weeping for her? No, he's not angry for that.
Here is the God of all creation, standing amidst and amongst his people. And his word is truth. His word is life. And to doubt God's word, to say, to say, God, your word is not adequate enough. That's one of the few things that can really incite the righteous anger of God. You know, when we think about, for example, the angel and Moses, when God called Moses to, um, to, to say, he said, I want you to go deliver my people. And Moses was like, well, but man, you know, I'm, look at me, I can't talk right, I've got talking issues, and I'm not that very, very powerful. And God was like, listen, you know, I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to, I'm going to do, I'm, you know, I'm going to speak. I'm going to do the things that I need to do. I just want you to go with my word. Just trust me with that. And, and he, he's like, for God, you know, still, you can't, you don't understand. He put it back on himself. Oh, no, it's not about me. And it's at that moment, it, 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 word of it, it word that uh, says his word, it, his anger, anger gets kindled. Against him. Nobody thinks about God being angry at Moses, right? But, but it's that idea that when we don't trust his word, that it, that, that, that is one thing that, that can lead to that, this deep, it's, it's an anger, why? Because, you know, just like when a child, they don't want to believe the word of their parent, right? And the parent might know, hey, going out and playing in the street is a dangerous thing, it's for your health and for your benefit, and so why would, why I'm saying don't go playing in the street, right? And, and so when a child goes and plays in the street anyway, they, they, they you know, kind of get angry because, you know what, you're, you're going against what I said, and, it, and, it's, and it's for your good. And uh, uh, and here is Jesus, the Lord of all glory, who is the one who created life, the one who is within him is life himself. And, and so this, this is part of that tension that he is feeling, the struggle between life and death and believing God's word, people not believing God's word, people not trusting him, people not seeing or understanding. But he's not just he's not just somebody here walking on earth that, you know, is doing a few things. This is the God of all glory. And um, and so he quickly responds, he says, Where have you put Peter? he asked. And they told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus another extreme emotion. Why would Jesus be weeping and saying? Would it be because Lazarus is dead? He knew. I don't think so. Because what? He knew he was coming to raise Lazarus from the dead. So why would he be grieving over that? Why would he be weeping over that? The people who were standing standing by, nearby, said, see how much he loved him? But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Right from human perspective, human reasoning. Um, that is, hey, that is certainly um, that is certainly Right, because we would think that moment, we would say, yeah, like, obviously if this guy was walking around healing people, he certainly could have saved last time. And then Luke, it's this next response right here in verse 38. Jesus was still moved as he arrived at the tomb. His band of emotions was weeping, anger, the righteous anger. As he's coming to this tomb, there's no doubt in his mind who he is. He he came from that. He knew the God of all glory. He was the God of all glory. He's the author of life. So for him, this was not even a thing. It was not even an issue. And uh, so he, he he gets to the stone, and there's a stone rolled across the entrance. He says, roll the stone aside. And what's happening? Where do 
So you know, this is part of that anger that we feel that we can be surrounded by all of this, and there can be that truth, but then to not, not to not believe it or not trust it. And then he goes on. He says, "But Martha, the dead man's sister, says the Lord has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible." Jesus responded, "Didn't I tell you, you would that you would see God's glory if you believed?" So they rolled the stone, and Jesus looked up into that. Thank you for hearing me. Hmm. Now Jesus is praying this out loud. Now think about this. Jesus has always had intimate relations with the Father. You go back and read through all the accounts of the Gospels. Every time they talk about Jesus slipping away and spending time with the Father. Why? Because he knew him and he loved him. Even when he was 12 years old, right? His parents were looking for him. And, and they were like, and they, they were leaving Jerusalem and they were like John halfway down the road and they were like, wait a minute, where's Jesus? And they go back and they find him and they talk to him. Didn't you know that it would be about my father's business? He's always been close to the father. He's always had intimate relationships, intimate conversations with the father. Most of which we've never even seen or heard. But here, he is alive. To be had. He's talking directly to the Father, but he's doing it in such a way out in the open that people can hear, right? And so he says, Thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. Why? Because that's the kind of relationship they have. But I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here, so that they will believe that you sent me. In other words, I want we want them to know how close. You and I really, really are. So he's about to demonstrate the ultimate miracle, the miracle of all miracles. He's about to raise someone back from the dead. So what does he do? Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and his feet were bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in head cloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. It was a man who was dead. Why did Jesus wait four days? He wanted people to understand clearly that there was no way that, like, he, he wasn't just knocked out accidentally. And it wasn't a situation where, uh, you know, people could mistake that maybe he was in some kind of uh, coma or something like that. But, man, he was dead as dead. It was to the point that they said, look, if you open up the grave, because they didn't embalm him like we do, right? In our culture, we think of, right, we embalm people and we come and we see like a week or two later after they, after they pass away, we see them laying there in, 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 in a coffin. Um, but in real life, if you just let them go, if you don't freeze them, if you don't let the, the body start to decay right away and it stinks, I think you've noticed that with animals that happen. Was in the day, man, right? You can't even walk by. That's the way, that's the, the decomposition process that's happening. And now here's this guy who was clearly without doubt dead. Now all of a sudden he's standing there, 
There was someone who came and demonstrated power over death. And if you are someone now who may be you yourself are wrestling with the idea of dying and not understanding what's coming, or maybe you are, uh, maybe you have a loved one that, that has passed away and you're struggling with, you know, what, what, where are they, where are they going, what's happening? Jesus is coming and saying. demonstrating this power and this authority over over this dominion, over the dominion that we live in. You have, you and I have someone whose words we can trust. You and I have someone who has been to the other side and has been back. You and I have someone who has lived outside of this age, beyond where we're at, and he's speaking to us. And he's giving us this hope this hope that's in that, that is in him. And that's why he's saying, if you I am the resurrection of life, he that believes in me, even though he was dead, yet shall live. I'm not always really wax eloquent with words. I was going through reading some of the letters I sent my mom and I go and I kinda laugh and chuckle. I said, Wow, I, I would say this that way or say this that way, but um but you know what, the hope, I can see the hope of Christ in my heart back then. And, I, and, it, and it's still here for you. And it's still here for you to, to believe and trust in Him. That we, there's somebody who, that came into this world and has spoken about the world after him. And he's backed it up. who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen, right? So some people believe. Listen, here's the thing. You don't want to follow the crowd. You want to listen to what the Spirit of God is teaching in your heart. Because the crowd doesn't always listen. There are some. There will be some who will listen to what I'm saying right now, who will be hearing the Word of God right now, and who will believe it. There will be some who will not. But you don't have to be. You can listen to what the Word of God is saying and you can respond. The Word of God in verse 46 it says, But some went to the Pharisees and told them that Jesus had died. And here's the ironic thing, right? Then the leading, Pharisee, leading priests and Pharisees called the high council together. What are we, what are we going to do then? Here's what's interesting. This man certainly performs many miraculous signs. You see, they didn't deny that Jesus did these things. There's enough credible witnesses to verify that Jesus was alive, that Jesus walked on this planet, that Jesus healed people, that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, that Jesus himself was risen from the dead. There's enough credible witnesses and even more than most historical accounts of things that we even have. And so here's what he's saying is that you, you can't deny the miracles. These people back then, they didn't deny the miracles. Instead, they said, look, they said, if he goes on like this, everybody's going to believe in him because he keeps doing these miracles. They didn't, it didn't matter to them that he was doing these things. He says, uh, and then the Roman army will come and destroy both our 
Jewish thing. It doesn't matter who our president is. It doesn't matter who our Congress people are. It doesn't matter what our situation is. Jesus is still building his kingdom. You see what these religious people feared? They feared the Roman army. They feared the destruction that would come. They feared the destruction of the temple. They feared the destruction of the nation. But what they didn't realize that it was Jesus who was right there, who was building his kingdom, who was building a nation of people who believed in him. And that is the message. And that's what's here for us. That's what I'm saying. No matter, even, even I know there's still some debate going on. Some people say, oh, one, this guy's president, the other one's not the president. And some folks are putting here saying, yes, yeah, so I think we finally have victory. Some are going, wait, no, we're still... It, listen, it, none of that matters. Because our hope is not in human government. Don't make the mistake that the Pharisees made. Our hope is in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Because you know what? Every one of our political leaders are all going to die. Every one of them are going to suffer the same fate that you and I are going to suffer. Every one of them is going to come to a place where their physical bodies are going to end. And then like the author of Hebrews says, after death comes judgment. Everything's got to give an account. So now what Jesus is saying is the, the kingdom, the miracle of the kingdom is doing. If, if you haven't had a chance to go back and, and view the series on, on where we talked about the kingdom, the heart, the kind of people that God is building, I encourage you to go back and, and to, to review that. Because the real miracle here is this. The real miracle is not that Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead. That is a miracle. But the real miracle is what happened in verse 45. That many people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw what happened. They understood that Jesus was the life. That he was the resurrection. Do you understand? That is the real miracle. When we understand that he's the one that's going to bring in his kingdom. And I wanted to encourage you this morning in that, in that word that, you know, what God's going to do. Um, and again, thank you. I, I know I know grieving is, is hard. It's hard to lose somebody. This has been a really emotional roller coaster for, for for me, for my brothers and sister. Um, it's been hard. But this is what's been in my heart as I've been thinking about all this. And I wanted to take you this moment to share it with you. So whoever you are, I don't even may, maybe you're watching this and I don't even know you. But I just pray that God's word will speak to you this moment. And uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to pray to you. Lord, this morning, uh, I thank you for those who have taken the time to listen to this message. Um, I, I can't, I can't, I'm not going to sit here and try to convince anybody to believe, Father. Uh, but, Father, I just want to share them with them your truth and let you, Spirit of the living God, do in their hearts what you have always done, what you've been doing for thousands of years. You've been taking your word and you've been changing people. That's the miracle of your kingdom. I'm thankful for the hope that we have. I'm thankful that we don't have to rely on our political leaders to usher in your kingdom. I'm thankful for that. And uh, so thank you for those who are hearing. Father, I pray for those, uh, Lord, those who are believers who, who, Lord, may be encouraged and strengthened. And Lord, maybe there's someone that's listening right now that uh, they haven't. Or maybe they're hearing it they're struggling with it, uh, Lord, that today would be the day that they give their life to you. Uh, and as in we pray, Lord. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call. My name is Pastor Keith. I should have said that at the beginning. I'm trying to get used to that. But thank you. Um, and if you want to, you know, if you're watching this on Facebook, want to you know, shoot us a, uh, a question or a comment or um, if you want to... Uh, you know, if you're watching on YouTube, if you have questions or whatever, just listen. Don't hesitate to call or question, or send an email, or whatever. And uh, we'd love to talk to you more about it. Thank you.
ਹਾਂਜੀ